Hello, I'm David. I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Centre. It's semester one, 2022, and this is the revision seminar for Statistical Practice One. Um, and I've had some requests, and I'm going to make do my best to talk about all of them, but I may do it in an idiosyncratic order. So um, let me talk this out. Um, all right. Um, I don't know what your lecture has told you about statistics, but my experience helping people from all over the university is that uh, the reason we have statistics as a discipline uh, is in order to help everyone else answer questions. Um, the point of statistics is to help answer questions using data. That's what it's for. And um, it pretty much never answers the question you really want. Like it can't. Right. Hmm. Statistics is only capable of answering questions that, that can be answered using data. Some questions can't be answered using data. And so we don't use statistics for those. Um, and it can only it can never give a hard and fast and complete yes this is definitely the truth answer um so only gives answers like you know probably or there is evidence for uh, and never, um, it is this way. <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. So all of your answers in a statistics course will always have at least one word in there to indicate that it is not 100% certain, always. I mean, unless you are just saying the mean of this data set is 5.7, like, it really is, but anything where you interpret anything always has a the data seems to show that, right? It seems to, or it appears that, or there is evidence for, or there is no evidence of. Like it's all about the evidence and about um, what you are interpreting, and you're clear that it's an interpretation. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, yeah. Okay. And, um, Almost all statistics, not all, but almost all statistics is in the service of a question that is, what is the relationship between these things? Almost all statistics is about the relationship between things. If you think about it, almost all science is about the relationship between things as well, especially science, which is about the treating of humans or animals. Um, it's about if I do these things to... Just give me a second. Just only just thought to check my audio. All right. Um, if I do these things... What will happen then? I mean, that's pretty much what most science is about. Um, and it's more like, if I do these things, will it be better afterwards? Um, but quite a lot of science is about comparing things as well. Are these things different to or similar to these other things? And so almost all this is about the relationship between things. Um, and that's a really important point. And I'm not being, they, I'm not just being general for, for, for no reason. Um, the things that you, the kinds of relationships you are interested in investigating and the kinds of things that are related help you decide what statistics to do. So that's what I want. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. So um, 
Okay. Right. So we're already at associations between things um, is um, what statistics is pretty much designed to help with. Okay, so this could also be associations. If you like. Okay. Right. Huh. So statistics can only help you answer things that you can answer using data. And so the kinds of questions we ask have to be turned into questions about data. And so science questions are almost always about um, the relationship between ideas. And you have to turn those ideas into recorded measurements in order to do statistics. So these are the two main flavors of, statistics, of science questions that statistics can help with. There are ones where there's just one idea and you just want to know more about it. Sort of a what's happening sort of question. Um, and then there are other ones which are about how things are related to each other. Is this idea related to this idea? So, for example, you could ask yourself um, whether the amount of time that a dog spends with their owner makes a difference to um, how quickly they toilet train, for example something you could be interested in. Uh, you could be interested in um, whether the amount of sleep someone has um, every, on average every night makes a difference to um, their grade um, on an exam, uh, for example. Um, and there are many things, and most of the things you ask about the relationship between several ideas. And it, your, most of the science questions are about something causing something else. But statistics is not capable of answering questions about things causing things. It can never answer those questions unless there is good experimental design to help. So, um, so experimental design, many people call that part of statistics, um, but it's separate from the calculation of statistics. So the statistical calculations themselves cannot tell you about whether things cause things. They can only tell you about whether things seem to be related, but not which causes which. Because the computer doesn't know what any of the numbers represent, and it doesn't know what order they are entered into the computer. It can only tell you these things appear to be related. Okay. I'll get to that in a second. No, I will. So this is where you're talking about this association thing that you were talking about. Questions we want to answer? Question stats can answer are not about ideas, but about measurements. Or if you like, variables. I'm going to add something back here. So this, um, questions we really want to answer is whether things cause things. But statistics is not able to talk about causation. 
it can do a particular direction, but only in a calculate sense. Can I use something to calculate what I expect the other thing to be? But it can't answer the question of whether they're caused by each other. Okay. How are people feeling at the moment? Right. So back in your science question, your science question would be, how does sleep make a difference to people's grades? And the only way to turn that into a statistics question is to figure out how to measure sleep. I mean, you could choose to measure the quality of people's sleep by sticking them in some sort of machine that measures alpha waves or something, delta, I don't know, waves, brain waves. You could measure the amount of sleep they have. You could measure how long it takes them to go to sleep. There's lots of choices and you have to, as a scientist, decide which one you want to use. But once you've done that, it becomes a variable. Once you record something individually on every individual that's, that's involved, it becomes a variable. And your idea of, of success in a course could be the whole grade, it could be um, the difference between your exam grade and your assignment grades, it could be um, the improvement across a, several years, like whatever. Like you have to choose. But once you've made a choice, it becomes a variable. Um, yeah, and so this choice of which, which way to measure your thing is not a statistics question, it's a science question. Um, and didn't really wasn't covered in this course. Um, but we did talk a little bit about bias. Bias? You talk about bias? Which was a way of making sure that the process that you use to record your variable has a better chance of reflecting the idea you want it to reflect. Um, yeah. So, cool. So when we talk about association, um, we're talking about the fact that this idea, the, the, the tension between the thing we want to be about cause and the, thing, and the fact that statistics cannot answer that question, it can only be about calculating one thing from another, predicting. Um, so, all right. So there are words for how things get in the way of that. So just to be clear, just to be absolutely clear, statistical Statistical calculations. Calculations can't um, tell causation. That's pretty much it. That's what experimental design is for. But once you have good experimental design, statistical calculations can tell you that things are related. And then you're, you can take that information and then say, ah, my experimental design says that the way that they're related is causationally, is causal. Um, but without the statistical calculations, you couldn't tell if they were related, not for sure. But without the experimental design, you can't tell which causes which. Right, so you need them both to do your science. Um, but I just, this is the... So what most people say when they do this um, is they say correlation is not causation. That's the classic thing that people say, which sounds lovely, it rolls off the tongue. But what it means is that the calculation, correlation is a statistical calculation, cannot tell you about causation. And I find that easier to process in my mind. Correlation is not causation is a lovely thing to say, but this is easier for me to understand. Okay. So after all of that fluff and bother, um, I can be sure about things. I can draw my picture in terms of what I think might be happening um, and um, have a name for the situation when things look like they're related, 
but they're not related causally in the way I expect. So there is terminology. but not causally, basically. Causally, it's a word now. <laughs> um, so by what will happen is that you can be described a situation and you could be, not, could be asked this relationship, is it causation or is it something else? And there are, are... yeah, okay. This is the thing we always hope for, to find. But there may also be... But if we're looking at this, it looks like one thing causes another, but then there's this other variable that's also having an effect, possibly on both of them. Um, This is called confounding, where there's another variable that I cannot tell which of the two causes it. That's the problem. So, There's more than one variable involved. Um, and I can't tell which, if any, causes changes in the outcome. And this is why in experimental design, you need to control your experiment. So more than one variable involved, and I can't tell which of any causes the outcome to change. Um, so this is why in an experiment, you have to think of all the things that could affect the outcome and try to control them. So confounding is solved by control, exper by experimental control. Well, prevent confounding. By experimental control, basically. So if you think that um, your treatment um, of soils will prevent your um, plants from getting fungal infections, but you also think that sunlight might make a difference to that, you want to make sure that all the plants that get the different treatments get the same amount of sunlight. That's the idea. And so the questions about this will be stories, right? They'll tell you a story about things that you're interested in, well, things that you have become interested in because it's an exam question. Um, and they will ask you um, whether there might be confounding and they might possibly ask you, how would you set this experiment up to prevent that confounding? Something like that. Um, yeah. I don't know, it just sounds like a classic assignment question sort of thing to ask. Is that sort of thing they've asked you before? I don't know, maybe it was in a tute. <laughs> um, yeah. What's our, what's our other terminologies that go with this? Anyone got one off the top of their head? I don't know, confounding is the biggest one. Yeah. So confounding is a basically a, a catch-all term for any time this happens where, where you can't tell what causes um, the outcome. Of course, you can never tell what causes the outcome. Um, 
I just want to point out that it can also happen that the causation is in the reverse direction than you than you think it is. Um, but I don't know if there's a word for that. Um, just some other things that might happen. You might think. that the cause is this way, but it might be actually that the cause is this way. So this is a very silly example, uh, but in uh, Terry Pratchett's book, um, I think it's in Truckers, anyway, one of the gnomes books, Masklin says he was always puzzled by um, the wind, and then he realized it was caused by the trees waving around so much. Uh, <laughs> so it's really easy to do, to confuse an effect with a cause. Um, yeah. And so that's one thing that could happen. And that's not confounding. That's just having your causation in the wrong direction. Um, and that can only be solved by doing an experiment where you do this thing first and then see if this happens. But some things cannot be experimented on that way. Um, so one of the classics is in educational research where you ask people if something that the Mass Learning Center did was useful. And it's like, well, maybe it's just that the people who would have found it useful went and used the service. Like we can't tell. I think what I do is useful, but um, some people argue that, well, only the good students use that service. And so how can you? be sure you're making a difference so bane of my life um yeah and uh the other one that's common you can think that this causes this but actually both of these things are caused by a third thing There is a word for this. This is called um, both variables are, uh, this is called there is a common response. Yeah. So the classic example that is brought up in almost every statistics course is that. Um, ice cream sales in summer and shark attacks at a beach in summer are related. When there's more shark attacks, there's more ice cream sales. But it's not that either of them causes the other, it's they're both caused by hot weather. Well, actually, they're both caused by more people being at the beach. Um, and so, um, yes. Let's stop there for a second. How are people feeling? But the only one I'm sure of the terminology is confounding. Um, and so you can say those variables are confounded um, and you need at least three variables to have confounding. You need an, a, an outcome and at least two things that could explain it. Um, the only other thing I can think of is called an interaction. So it may be that there's one last thing, which is that yes, this does cause this to change, but there's a third variable that changes the way that this changes that. For example, um, it's like, this is called an interaction. Third variable, or, or idea changes the way that one variable affects another. That's called an interaction. So an example of that is, um, well, drug interactions. So um, some drugs sort of cancel each other out. 
Um, so it may be that a drug does have an effect on your mood, but a second drug makes it lower. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing about an interaction, though, someone just get me like okay. interaction. Um, so eating spinach improves your iron levels in your blood. But having vitamin C at the same time improves it even more than you would expect by, because vitamin C doesn't do anything to your iron levels. It just makes it easier to, to absorb iron from food. And so um, vitamin C on its own, if you just give people vitamin C on a daily basis, it doesn't make any difference to their iron levels. But making them have vitamin C at the same time as eating food makes their iron levels go up. And so um, there is an interaction saying that, that while this might not be related to that very much, it changes the way that this is related to that. Um, and there's a thing, there's some things about um, children and adults where some things are much more effective for adults than they are for children. Um, they're effective for both, but for adults, they're much more effective than children and vice versa. And so that's saying being a child makes a difference to how this makes a difference to you. That's interaction. Right. Cool. Not that that sort of comes up very much, but it does come up when you do two-way and over. Um, it may or may not, I don't know, but it's a thing. Um, all right. I'm feeling, I'm feeling all right. <laughs> I hope everyone's okay with that. So there's all these nuances that sort of get in the way of being able to interpret your results. And most of them are solved um, by trying to do your experiment very carefully and controlling for things that you think might affect the results pretty much. And so one of the morals that you're supposed to learn in the statistics course is do experimental design carefully. But you learn experimental design in a different, like in a research methods course, and you'll learn it in each different kind of science. Um, yeah, so cool. So almost everyone has a course like in second or third year called research methods in insert discipline here. Um, and then that's where you learn experimental design. Um, yeah, and there's a little tiny bit of it in science or fiction, as I recall, um, yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to say one more thing. Even though statistics cannot help you decide, for example, between these things, can't help. That's what experimental design is for. But it can tell you that these things are related. And statistics cannot help you to tell if there's a third variable that affects these two things. But what it can tell you is that these two things are related. It is statistically true that ice cream sales are higher at the same time as shark attacks are higher. It is the truth on average. <laughs> but see, had to put in my little batteries not included. It's statistics, you never say anything straight up. Um, it is the truth that they tend to be higher at the same time. We don't know if they cause each other. It sounds ridiculous that they do, um, but statistics can help you decide that they are related. So what statistics can't do is do causation, but it can allow you to take some things that are related and calculate what you expect the other thing to be at the same time. That's what statistics ultimate goal is usually to do, to predict one thing from another. Whether they're, whether they're causally related or not is irrelevant to the statistics. It's just, can you calculate one from the other? That's the idea. And you tell what this thing is going to be on average when that thing changes, when that thing is different, not when it changes. So that's what statistics can do. But it can do it differently in different settings. So we're down to it now. We're up to what the stats can do. I need more space. It can calculate one thing from another thing. 
Now you might think it might be better for me to draw these arrows from left to right, but R, the computer program, draws it the other way. So I just wanted to do it this way. Well, yep, and you also write Y twiddle X when you do a regression. That's how you do regression, isn't it? With a little twiddle sign. Yeah, so this is the output and this is the input. So I will call this an explanatory variable. Is that what they call it, explanatory? But just remember in other disciplines, they may call it, um, in other disciplines, they may call it an independent variable. Um, or something else entirely. And I call this an outcome. I'm pretty sure that your lecturer calls it a response variable. Does that sound right? But in science, you call it a dependent variable. So the words dependent and independent are science words, not statistics words. Um, they are about experimental design. You talk about this is the these are the independent variables. They're the ones I'm capable of controlling in my experiment, and the dependent variable is the thing that happens. And the really interesting thing about the way we use the words is that the response variable seems to suggest that there's a cause relation, right? It says that this thing responds to this thing. But statistics can't tell you whether things respond to things. It just can tell you whether they're high or low at the same time, which I think is fascinating um, from a language point of view, that our language keeps reinforcing the idea that it's about causation, even though statistics can't answer that question, which I think is just rather interesting. So no matter what the words seem to suggest to you, remember, it's not about causation. I call it the outcome because it's literally the outcome of the calculation. You do a calculation with this thing, it spits out an answer, and this is what you get. Okay. Cool. All right. It can also do this. Where there's nothing that you're using to predict the changes and it can just allow you to answer questions of um, what's going on you know how is this variable how is it <laughs> um, the word is distribution so we can look for this is still a variable, but it's not an outcome or explanatory variable today because it's just there. There's nothing affecting it. It's just there. And we can ask questions about the distribution. And this is a stats word. And distribution means, well, you can talk about the distribution of koalas in the South Australian bush, for example. They talk distribution means how things are spread out. And the thing that we are interested in how it is spread out is the probabilities. How likely is it to be in one place, one to be one number compared to another? Is it more likely to be near this number or far away from this number? Those are the sorts of questions we can ask ourselves. Is it this number on average? How spread out it is, is it? Those sorts of things. So when we're asking questions about distribution, it's like, how spread out is it? Um, is it centered on this number? Those sorts of questions are questions you ask about distributions. Yeah. So you can ask those questions about these too, but when you've got two variables, you're more interested in how they're related. So these sorts of questions you can answer by, you can argue there's two things you can ask. You can say, well, how is it spread out as a whole? And that's what graphs are for, like histograms and box plots. Um, and then you can ask also ask, is it spread out according to this number? 
is it is is that centered on this number and those are questions about specific parameters they're called so a number that describes a distribution is called a parameter meter meaning measurement para meaning following or similar to a measurement that follows the thing actually it's more the other way the measurements follow anyway whatever okay i don't know if that helps i'm just putting out words while i'm thinking of them okay uh, but a number that describes there we can get in there. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. One last thing before I get to this. We are now at to, we now know what statistics is capable of answering questions of these two types. But we need to know what kind of variables there are to choose from. And there are two, technically four, but actually two. Um, so they did this early in the course as well, the different types of variables, right? Like continuous and discrete and categorical yeah there are two main flavors of variables and it's really important to know which one you've got because it changes the kinds of statistics you can do and it changes how easy it is to tell if things are related and the two main kinds of variables i call them numerical and categorical i'm pretty sure your lecturer calls them categorical and quantitative not sure So I call them numerical variables. Your um, lecturer calls them quantitative variables. Types of variables. Um, and there's categorical variables and other places in the world call them qualitative. So a numerical variable describes, um, is measured as a number. Or counted, I guess it doesn't have to be measured, just be written down as a number. Um, and a categorical variable is literally a category. And sometimes it can be hard to tell which is which. Um, because sometimes the names of your categories are also numbers. And so you need to decide if the number you've got really is a number or it's just the name of the category. You know how to tell? Have people had trouble telling this? Are we okay? Okay. Um, I usually ask the question, does it make sense to say how far apart they are? So can I cal do the calculation of subtraction and does it mean something? Um, so if you can do the calculation of subtraction and it means something, then it really is a number. But if you can't, then it doesn't. Um, yeah. Um, so, for example, postcode is recorded as a number. It does, in general, tend to get higher the further away from the city you are, um, but it's not like 5118 is two more than 5116. Like, the two-ness doesn't mean anything, and so it's not really a number. Yeah. Okay. And within these, there's some subcategories, as far as I recall. 
Um, there are discrete and continuous numerical variables, and there are nominal and ordinal categorical variables. Do they talk about nominal and ordinal? But the really important decision is between categorical and numerical. That's the most important decision. Um, but I will just point out while I'm here, just so that I'm covering all the bases, there is the so numerical comes in two flavors, discrete and continuous. And uh, discrete variables only have certain numbers they're allowed to be. Generally, they happen when you count things. And continuous is usually happens when you measure things. And the way to tell the difference is also about um, the gaps between things. So when I did subtraction, just a second, I should actually write that down. implies quantitative. Um, numerical uh, variables discrete and continuous is also about subtraction. You know that subtraction means something both for discrete and continuous variables, they're numbers. Um, but the gap between two possibilities always has another possibility between them when you've got a discontinuous variable. Whereas with a discrete variable, you get to this point where they're close enough together and there's nothing between them no number that you can possibly have between these two numbers. But with a continuous variable, no matter how small you make it, there's always another one between that you could choose. So, um, gap between two possible numbers always another possible number between. That's what continuous means. Theoretically, it might not actually be possible to measure that graininess. But I will say that almost all the time, no one cares. Like later on when you're doing statistics and you're counting stuff or you're measuring stuff, won't make any difference to the kind of statistics you're going to do. No one cares. Like unless the only options are like zero, one, and two, for example. Um, but if there's more than like 15 different numbers you could choose, eh, doesn't matter. No one cares. Um, and you will have seen it in your assignments. You've done T tests on both things that are counted numbers and things that are measured numbers. No one cares, just whatevs. Statisticians, statistics, because it has, you know, we try and be really precise when we're doing it, as precise as we can, but it always has that little bit at the end where it's like, well, I can't be 100% sure anyway, so whatever. Um, always seems like that when you get there. It's like being gaslit. And you're, like, well, you're being so precise, but then at the end you say, possibly. <laughs> okay. Um, that's just how it feels doing statistics. And then categorical variables come in two flavors as well. Um, nominal and um, ordinal. Um, uh, mm, I don't know a nice little thing at this thing, but no, nominal things are names for things. That's what nominal actually means. It means referring to names right, in a literal sense. Um, ordinal means referring to the order that things come in. Um, and so and they're, they're sort of like sizes or degrees.
No. Postcodes are nominal, straight up. Because they're more or less just a number name for a suburb. You might as well just call it Woodland Park. Yeah. Um, yeah. They are not ordinal. Not fully, right? Because the bigger ones are further from the center. But it's not like there's a whole range of, like if you draw it, there's a whole range of suburbs that all have different numbers at all the same distance from the center. And so like you can't really put them in order. Yeah. So um, but ordinal is sizes and degrees. And it's also about comparing things. Um, so with with numbers, you can literally subtract them and get a new number and it will tell you how far apart they are. Um, but with categories, you can't subtract them to tell how far apart they are, but you can compare them and say, is this one higher than this one? And so if you can compare, which possibility is higher, then that's ordinal. But I will say something, almost all statistics can't actually keep the information that it's ordinal. Even if you have something that is ordinal, like steak doneness, you know, rare, medium, and well done, that's a perfectly good ordinal categorical variable. Like you could actually do a real number and do the amount of time it's been cooked, but what else? Like, like that. If, you've, if you have lumped numbers together into categories, then it becomes an ordinal categorical variable. So if you've got age brackets, like under 20, 20 to 50, over 50, it came from a number, but at the moment, the way it's written, it's, it's a category um, because you can't subtract them because you can't subtract 20 to 40 from over 50. There's not a specific number that you can do a subtraction on. And so that is not numerical, um, not in the way it's currently written. And that's really important. Statistics can only be done on the numbers as, and or words as you currently have them. You can rearrange them later, but you can't get back people's ages from their age categories. You just don't know. Um, and so when you're collecting data, you should almost always have. Um... So in the lectures, they said natural ordering, nominal, no natural ordering. Yep, I agree with it. And it is important to have a natural ordering for things. There should be a natural reason. Thank you for adding that. <laughs> um, and I will say, letters of the alphabet, that does not count as a natural ordering. Just pointing that out. Right. B is not higher than A. So it has to be natural in the sense of um, comparing the goodness or betterness or laterness or whatever it has to be something that's worth that you could have probably measured with a number if you wanted basically yeah and actually that's the problem with ordinal categorical variables you could have measured them with numbers if you wanted to you just didn't because maybe you couldn't today but theoretically it's possible to measure them with numbers you just don't have that information to hand yeah so i, I find that fascinating so you're <laughs> Computers cannot deal with ordinal data, pretty much. There are ways, some statistician is going to descend from on high and slap me for saying something like that. There are methods for dealing with ordinal categories. Um, but the way to deal with ordinal categories is either to ignore the fact that they're in an order, and you just deal with that yourself by looking at the graph and go, well, I'm just going to make sure I draw the graph in the correct order but the statistics isn't going to be able to tell which one is later than which one, um, or you pretend that they're really numbers after all. Um, so 
in the grand scheme of things in this course, ordinal data is not going to be treated any differently from nominal data. Other than when you draw the graph, you want to put it on the x-axis in the correct order. That's pretty much it. Because otherwise people will read it and go, why is this in this order? Yeah. Which is still an important statistical decision, how to draw your graph so that people can read it. Um, but, you know, not that important. All right. Cool, 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 cool. So now you've asked, how do you decide? Well, how do you decide which stats to do? Um, but I'm going to take a little detour before I talk about that and just talk about the chi squared test for a bit. So just interlude chi squared tests because I promised I would, and it's already 10 past 11. So I'm going to um, talk about that now. Unless, but wait, wait, if I do this properly, anything that I've said or related to the, what I've said or just not related, it's just something that popped into your head that you would like to ask at this time. It could also be just be unrelated and you just hope that I talk about it later. The, that yes, the 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 I'm going to repeat that. The order that we have written the alphabet in, alphabetical order, is an unnatural order. <laughs> so it doesn't that is unnatural. I'm going to add that to to my piece of paper here. Thank you very much. I will say though, the funny thing is that R automatically puts things in alphabetical order without if it's got if it hasn't got any other options. Like the weird thing is, like, it is a natural thing to do. Like if your only decision about the difference between ordinal and, ordinal and nominal is which order you put them on a graph, then alphabetical order is not the worst option. <laughs> um, but it's not; it's being treated as nominal. Um, I find it funny talking about this because it's so such low importance in the scheme of doing statistics, um, but it's a thing that we talk about. And so we have to talk about it to figure out where the line is. And if someone's going to ask you an exam question, you want to know what they want you to say. So, yeah. So we're now playing the game of not just understanding statistics, but doing an exam, which is something important we have to think about. Yeah. Okay. I'm very glad um, that uh, our friend in the Zoom, I'm trying not to say people's names so they don't appear, appear on the video, um, but our friend in the Zoom um, has said, I'm glad you mentioned that natural thing because it's a nice way of indicating what, what the problem is with the alphabetical order. Um, it is a natural thing for humans to decide an order for the alphabet, but it could have been decided differently. For example, in the Greek alphabet, zeta, which is our Z, is like the sixth letter. So, okay. So uh, one of the other students very helpfully um, sent me the lecture slides that go with the chi-squared tests. So that was very nice of them. Um, and there are two chi-squared tests in this course mentioned right near the end of the course, in week 11 or something. Um, and we would like to distinguish between them and distinguish between them and the other kinds of tests that we can do with other kinds of data. And so through this, I'm going to talk about some aspects of deciding what stats goes with what to answer your question. But I want to talk about this now because it will help me make sense of the other stuff. Right. So the chi-squared tests, there are two of them, and they deal with categorical data. And when I say categorical data, I mean that each individual person or object involved, like the subjects of the experiment, 
each individual one of them has categories recorded about them, categorical variables recorded about each individual. That's sort of what I mean. So don't you... No. Okay, I just want to point this out. Way back here when we're talking about variables, don't be fooled. Just because you record a number somewhere doesn't mean that your variable is categorical. When we talk about categorical variables in, the sen in this sense, we are almost always referring to the thing that was written down about the people or objects in your experiment not what you wrote down about the entire experiment as a whole. So for example, if you record whether people like cats or dogs or neither, for each person, there is, there is words that you write down. You have cat, yes or no, dog, yes or no. Each person has two categorical variables recorded about them. But when you write down the information for the entire group, you write down how many people like cats and how many people like dogs. And those are numbers, yes, but those numbers belong to the whole group, not to any one person. It's really important to, when you're doing this decision about what kind of variables are involved, to make sure it's about the individuals, not the groups. Unless you're, rec you're unless the things that you're recording information about are groups as well, so we can get into the details on that. But it's not about the whole data set. It's about the individuals and what's been written about down about each one. It's a really important point. I've had people come to me in later years trying to do, do analyze their data and they said, hey, look, I've written down how many people were in each category. That's numerical, right? And say, well, not in the sense that you need it to be. The individual people, they were in categories. Yeah. So it's really important to know who belongs, who your data belongs to. So it may be that there are two questions, two main types of questions that I already talked about that you can ask about, about um, data. You can have a single variable. And your variable is one or two or however many categories. And you can ask questions about this single variable all by itself. So what's going on? How are the people spread out across the options. I mean, we can ask about the distribution. Or you can ask yourself this variable. Can I use this variable to make any predictions about this one? Are they related in some way? So I can either stick my arrows in both directions, and that's probably what I'm going to do. Doesn't really matter which way around, whether there's an arrow going one way or the other or both ways. Statistics can't really help either way. So this kind of question is what the chi-squared goodness of fit test is for. And this kind of question is the chi-squared test for association or independence. Just chi-squared test usually is what they call it. Just going to look it up. Give me a sec.
technically it's the chi-squared test for association. But in your course, they just call it the chi-squared test, which is weird because it's just a chi-squared test because there's another one over here. <laughs> ah, damn, I hate the naming of statistical tests. They are variously named after one of the calculations you do along the way, the purpose, or a person with no particular rules. Um, or the vibe. Like analysis of variance is just like, well, this, that's just what we're going for. We're analyzing the variance. But it's not particularly clear about what that means. Um, anyway, sorry. Yeah. It's like most science. Things are just made up as we go along. Okay. And so this answers the question, this answers the question of is there a relationship between these two variables? It's a yes or no question. All hypothesis tests answer yes or no questions. So and the official word you use is association. But in my head, it's relationship. And in this one is also a yes or no question because that's what they're for. The yes or no question are, is, is this list of probabilities the correct distribution? So do I think it's 50% here, 20% here, 30% here? Does the data seem to match with that? So it's an entire distribution. So I'm saying, are the people, or whatever these objects are, distributed across the options in this way? That's what I'm asking. Does anyone have any questions about that? I'm going to do proper examples, so it will make more sense in a minute. But it would be nice to know if you had a question so that I could make sure the examples <laughs> answered it. <coughs> okay, you don't. The categories in this way that I'm thinking of. I'm going to be really precise about it in a minute. Mm -hmm. So, for example, is it 50% yes, 20% no, 30% don't care? That's the hot, the, what the yes or no question it's answering. For example, so for example, you might have a category that you might ask people, do you think yes or no, or do you not care? And I can say, is it for all possible people, is it this distribution? 50% yes, 20% no, 30% don't care. That's what I'm asking, that sort of question. But I could also be asking any other combination of these to decide if the data I've got is consistent with all people falling into those categories in that way and just happening to randomly pick people that fall into the categories the way I've got them. So I'm going to talk it through about how we do it. Okay. So you actually had already um, hypothesis test that dealt with specific versions of these questions before. But I'm going to get back to those. I'm going to talk about how this one works the way it works. So I'm going to do goodness of fit.
Okay. So your chi squared test for goodness of fit goes like this. I'm just going to do it as an example. You do a survey to ask people if um, Hub Central TV screen should show um, the Soccer World Cup. Um, 50 people responds. And um, 20 say yes. 15 say no. What are we up to? 35? And 15 say don't care. Oh, there's a Hub Central TV screen. Um, so <laughs> 15 people say, what's Hub Central? Um, anyway, <laughs> but it's it. say don't care. That adds up to 50, doesn't it? Yes, okay. Former test to decide if the proportions for all students in these categories is 50%, uh, 25%, 25%. Like that. You could have picked any other percentages you wanted, but this is just a contrived question that, that I could ask, imagine asking in an exam. Or if you like, um, no, that's fine. Normally, when you do this, you ask, are they all the same? And maybe I'll do another example like that in a minute. But I'm just gonna run with this. So this question, every individual has responded with a yes with a yes, a no, or a don't care. These are the three options that they've all responded to. And I'm asking, what's the distribution of that? Is it distributed such that half the people say yes Half of all people would have said yes if I had asked them. So it's always about, um, hypothesis tests are always about what could have happened. So I'm not asking about the 50 people that I asked. I'm asking about all the people that could have been asked. So all the people that could have been asked would, are they distributed according to 50% would have said yes and 25% would have said no and 25% would have said don't care? That's the question I'm asking. Okay. So in that sense, here's how to do it. So here's my table. Table of observed counts. Yes, no. Don't care, total. Cool.
So it's supposed to be, I would have expected there to be 50% here and 25% here and 25% here. I've got like 40% here um, and whatever that is, 30% and 30%. I want to figure out if what I've got is enough to make me not believe this. And so I need a table expected count. So if there were still 50 people, and so I want this to be 50%, which would be 25 people. And I want this to be 30%, sorry, 15%. Uh, which would be, um, what, 7.5 people? And I want this to be 15%, which is 7.5 people as well. Let's just check 25 plus 15 is, no, 12.5, sorry. No. Damn it, it's 25%. That's why. It, yep, I'm good now. I'm getting confused with the 15s there. Right. That's better. <laughs> and I need to compare what I actually observed to what was the most likely thing to have happened, basically. This is the most likely thing to have happened if the percentages really were 50%, 25%, 25%. Now, I know that it was not going to be this every time. It's not going to, if I collect, 50, even if for 50% of people, they will always, they would say yes, I'm not going to get exactly 25 of them saying yes in a sample of 50. It could be different numbers. I mean, I could get them all saying yes if I was very, un, very lucky or unlucky. Um, I could get them all saying don't care. Um, I could get this. This is one of the things I could have got. I mean, I did get it. Um, and so I need to compare this option to all the things that could have happened and this is the most likely thing that could have happened and so the what probably pearson um figured out back in the day like between 1890 and 1940 whatever um what pearson figured probably pearson could have been someone else but he was big on the chi-squared statistic was Pearson, um, back in the day, uh, was that I could do this calculation and I can think about all the things that this calculation could have been. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go observe minus expected squared divided by expected. That's how you do it, isn't it? I think so. Let me just check. Yep, same as before. Good, good, good. So for every cell in the table except the total, we go observed minus expected squared divided by expected. So we're going to go 20 minus 25 squared divided by 25. And that would be 1. Of course, the um the computer can. Um, but I just wanted to point out that we can do that. Um, uh, this would be fifteen minus twelve point five squared divided by twelve point five. That's how we need to calculate that. Exactly. 0 0.5. Neat. That would be extremely rare, I'd say. And this one's the same. So you do that for every cell, and then you add them up.
Okay. And that total, that is the chi-squared statistic. Would anyone like to say something or ask something at this point? I think there is actually, just a second. No, but the square root of it has a name. It's called the standardized residual. It's the square of the standardized residual. Yep. So just a second, the square root of this. Called. Analyze residual, whatever. I'd... Residual over in regression means how far the um, predicted value is from the real value. Um, and so I guess that's, you know, observed minus expected is the residual and the standardized one, because when you square root at the top bit, the square goes away, you end up with observed minus expected. So just a second, the observed minus expected divided by the square root of the expected is called the standardized residual. So we standardize it by dividing it by the square root of the expected for reasons that Pearson can't tell us because he's dead. Um, so, um, okay, I'm sure that someone knows. So here's the thing. What Pearson discovered was that if you've got enough data, so where all of these numbers are more than five, basically, if you've got enough data, then if you think about all of the sets of tables that I could have had, so imagining that I live in a world where this really is the percentages for all people, and I imagine all the tables of data that I could have had, and I compare this and I imagine all of the chi-squared statistics that I could have had by doing this calculation. Imagine all this data. Imagine doing all these calculations. And I compare all the calculations I could have had to the one I've got here. Then the distribution of the number of the calculations that could have been done is the chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom in this case. So the distribution... Um, I didn't write down a null hypothesis, did I? Sorry. Um, the null hypothesis is going to be hard to write down, but I will write it down. Just a second. Ah. <sighs> So the null hypothesis is the thing that we have to assume in order to calculate the probabilities involved, basically. Um, they talk about it being the status quo, about being, you know, the, the no relationship or whatever. Really a lot more practical than that. It's just whatever you have to assume to do the calculations, really, in the practical sense. So the null hypothesis is that we are going to imagine that this is the truth 
and do and imagine all of the things that could have happened. And so our truth that we are imagining is that these are the real probabilities. And so we're going to say the null hypothesis is that uh, the proportion of yes is 0 0.5, the proportion no is 0 0.25, and the proportion don't care is 0 0.25. Where P yes is the true proportion of students who would say yes. And P no is the same, but for, for but for no, and P D C is the same. But for don't care. So this bit here is called defining the parameters. So when they give you an assignment or exam question, they say, write down the null hypothesis, defining any parameters you use. That's what this bit is. Because your null hypothesis is supposed to be a list of symbols equals a list of numbers, usually. You are allowed to write your null hypothesis down in words if you want in special circumstances. Um, but in this circumstance, this really is a null hypothesis that the true proportions are 50%, 25%, 25%. I should have done that earlier, but that's what it is. And this is the thing we're assuming in order to do our calculations. So if we imagine that this is true for all possible students, and we imagine all the collections of 50 students we could possibly have collect we could possibly have collected, and we imagine all of their tables, and we imagine all of these calculations with the observed minus expected squares and expecteds, and get all of these things to produce this thing called chi squared. If we imagine all of those, then the distribution of all of the things that could have happened is called the chi squared distribution. Hence the chi squared test. Don't know why chi squared. I don't know why it's not X, but you know, they're, they're lovers of the Greek alphabet, our, our 20th century statisticians. Um, and so the distribution of the test statistic, if the null hypothesis is true, is chi squared distribution. And then you need another number just here to tell you which chi-squared distribution it is, because there's more than one. Yep, chi-squared distributions live on a street and you just have to know the correct address. Which number house do they live in? And the number house that, they, that this one lives in today is two, which is going to be the number of possible categories minus one. Three possible categories, minus one. Right. So if there had been six categories, it would have been the chi-squared distribution with two, with five degrees of freedom. Um, and this thing is called the degrees of freedom. There are reasons why it's called the degrees of freedom, but I usually just see it as the DF, which is the distribution finder. It helps you find the correct distribution. In this sense, it does have a meaning. If it was a total of 50, and I want to, I'm imagining all of the groups of 50 I could have had, then once I've chosen two of these groups, the other one has to be whatever's left over. So I'm only free to choose how many is in two of these boxes. That's the how much freedom I've got is two boxes can be chosen. And then since I'm imagining groups of size 50, the other one is, is completely determined once I've chosen two of them. So that's what it's referring to with the degrees of freedom there. And so I compare, so these are all possible chi-squared chi 
statistics that could have happened and they will look like this and here's mine and then i will figure out how many of them are worse than this because if it had been exactly on 2015 if it had been exactly on these numbers the answer would have been zero right it can't be because they're 0.5 and they're people but whatever if it had been exactly these numbers that came out in my data the answer would have been zero and the closer i am to zero the more likely it is basically um technically it's not very likely to be exactly zero but it gets more less likely there and so it's only going to be this end here that area is the p-value so i could go and ask my computer what that probability is and if i asked the computer to do this whole thing for me it would give me a chi-square statistic it would give me that probability now i can't remember the um r command that goes with this just give me a second now this too today is a statistic sorry i'm sorry for giving you one where it was um, the same answer i really didn't mean it to be that way i should have changed one of my numbers so just to be clear if this had been a 14 and a 16 My answer would have come out to ah. Two point one six. Just to make sure that we are aware that that two is not the test statistic; it's a completely different thing. All right, is that okay? I just well, I just want to change the original problem so it comes out to so it's usually some sort of decimal at this point. Um, and so this thing here won't become a two point one six; it's just the number two, because this is the number of possible categories minus one. 2.16 yes good move yep cool now i can't remember the r command that does this just give me a sec We get to see all the stuff that I use to do visits to the MLC. Come on. Don't do the spinning hoop on me now. What the hell? Okay. Use R in this course, don't you? Oh, it does them both. Cool. So I'm just checking something. Do you normally do this 
I'm just, just you're going to have to tell me because every every course uses a different computer program for statistics. Um, do you in your assignments had did you do these things and they had a list of who's in what category and then it figured out all this itself? No. I uh, I think. Okay, it would be like an Excel thing. Okay. I just want to, I'm just going to make some data. Just bear with me. You don't have to know how to do what I'm about, what I'm doing. Um, okay, maybe I need another bracket. Something like that. There's all these yeses and then nos and then DCs. That's what your data would normally look like. And I'm pretty sure if I do this, I squared dot test, and then I have to put in some data. And then I have to put in the probabilities. So I had 50% and 25% and 25% and it should work. Crap. Worth a try. No, no, it can't do it with that. It's okay. Sorry. Hmm. I do not like it. I'm just going to see if what this does. I'm going to put in the first table, which was 20 and 14 and no, 20 and 14 and 16. And then I'm going to put in the, the things I'm comparing to 20, 50%, 25%, 25%. Hey, that's the one. We had to put in chi squared test. This is my original table. And I had to tell it that the second one was a probabilities, a list of probabilities. Right. Like in my um, hypothesis, my null hypothesis, I called them all P. And look, there's my 2.16, like I calculated myself. Degrees of freedom is two. The p-value is 0 0.3396. which is really huge. So I have no evidence to suggest that that isn't the correct list of probabilities. So I'm just gonna write down on my page what I wrote in, um, in R to make this happen. <laughs>
right. And so this is what I typed. And then my p-value came out to this, which is extremely high. And so regardless of what, you know, I could do a 5% level, I could do a 10% level, doesn't matter. Um, so this is a very large number. And so I conclude. True proportions could in fact be 50%, 25%, 25%. There is not strong evidence otherwise. There's no strong evidence against it. But if my p-value would come out to be 0 0.0002, I would have said there is strong evidence to suggest that the true proportions are not 50%, 25%, 25%. But they totally could be this. But I'm also, notice I'm not saying the true proportions are 50%, 25%, 25%, I just, they could be. There is no evidence to suggest they're not, but there's probably also no evidence to suggest they're not 51%, 24%, 25%. How are you feeling about that process? Now, I don't know if they want you to be able to know what our commands do in the exam, like to come up with the correct R command. In past exams, they've given you R commands and asked you to interpret what happened. Yeah. So is that what they said? Yeah. But just in case one day, you want to know there it is all right oh wow i'm gonna still talk about the other one i will not be offended if you have to go um but i promised i would um to this other person so i'm gonna talk about the other card spread test i just want to do one more example without going through all of the machinations of this one You rolled a, a six-sided die and get these results. Like that. Is there evidence that the die is not fair? And so this is again a technically, this is a numerical variable, the number that the die produces. But each one of it, the die could just as easily have had the letters A, B, C, D, E, F written on them. And so I can think about it as a category if I want, because each number has its own probability. And so I can ask, I can do a chi-square test for goodness of fit um, by switching my perspective and saying, actually, I'm going to treat those numbers as a category today. So I've got dice rolls. I'm going to treat it as a number uh, category with six categories. That's what I'm imagining here. And so I'm going to ask myself, so the null hypothesis is that if it was fair, they should all be the same probability. All the probabilities are one sixth. And so I need to add this up and figure out what my expected table would be.
50, 70, 80, 93. Good on me for not making it up to 100. That would be too easy. <laughs> But 93 oh, divided by 6 is not too bad, is it? At least it's a multiple of 3. They're all 15.5. So the expected table is this. Like that. Okay. And so now I do my observed minus expected squared divided by expected, but I don't have to if I ask the computer to do it. I can do my R command. And I don't even need to do this actually to do it. Actually, do you know what? I'm just going to ask my computer to do it. I'm going to do the R command. And I'm going to do chi squared test 20, 15, 13, 5, 10, 30. And I can put in my P and actually write 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6, 6. And do you know what? If you don't tell it what the P is, it's going to assume it's all equal. So I could do this. I could do comma P equals. You need to see so that it thinks that it's a list of things. I could do that, but I could also not write that at all and it would just do it automatically. Yeah. Yep. So you could just write chi squared test and just put in the numbers to begin with because the computer, if you don't tell it, will assume that you want them all to be the same. Even that friendly of it. I read that in the um in the notes that I read just just like ten minutes ago. So let's do it. Twenty, fifteen, thirteen, five, ten, thirty. There we go. And I get a chi-squared statistic of 24.355 and a p-value of 0 0.0001855. Okay. And it does say the degrees of freedom is five, which is what I'd expect because there were six categories and the degrees of freedom is one less than the number of categories you've got. So. Chi square distribution with five degrees of freedom. The fifth chi square distribution. And so I have strong evidence here. This is below 0.05, it's below 0.01. Like I've got very strong evidence to suggest that the die is not fair. Because if the die were fair, the probability should have been all one six. And the computer thinks this is really unlikely if the probability really was one six. So strong. How do people feel about what I did there? I feel good about it. <laughs> okay, so I won't be offended if you go, but I'm just gonna keep talking until I've done the other thing. So. All right, now for the other chi-squared test. This chi squared test just asks about are the probabilities set up in a way that I like? You know, are they all equal? Um, are they whatever this random thing that I thought they should be? Um, but the chi squared test for association is not about how the probabilities are arranged per se, it's about whether one variable makes a difference to the probabilities of the other variable. I'm just going to start a whole new page for it, really. Uh, 
Okay. So the chi squared test for association answers a question like this. So it's been a while since I drew that. So I'm just going to um, draw it again. It doesn't matter how many categories there are on each side. Okay. All right. You ask people of various ages. Whether they know who Buzz Lightyear is. And I say this because I watched Toy Story 4 for the first time yesterday, so it's on my mind. He was all right. Wasn't nearly as good as any of the other ones. But Buzz Lightyear's uh, like inner voice was, was really quite a, that was a great storyline. I liked it very much. But moving on, um, you ask people of various ages whether they know who Buzz Lightyear is. Um, but so in this question at the moment, the, the way it's pitched at the moment, I, a question I could ask is, do older people or younger people, are they more or less likely to know who Buzz Lightyear is? And at the moment, it sounds like it's about the relationship between a category, knowing who Buzz Lightyear is, and a number, how old you are. But if I recorded my data in a certain way, it would be a category. So I can say this is how the data is recorded. No Buzz Lightyear and age. Yes, no. Let's do that. So because of the way the data has been collected, my age is a category. Even though I might have possibly recorded their ages individually as numbers, I just can't tell at this time. And so I have to treat this as every person has two categories recorded about them. They have the no, the Buzz Lightyear. No Buzz Lightyear, yes or no and age, which comes in three categories. Now, this is technically an ordinal variable. Definitely, any person that says 20 to 50 is older than any person who says under 20. This is an ordinal variable. And almost all ordinal categorical variables were created as categories from a numerical variable like this. Technically, this is ordinal too, because you know yes is more than no, but doesn't really matter because there's only two options. So I'm interested in how these are related. Yep. 
Is there evidence? that people of different ages know Buzz Lightyear more or less. So we can ask that question. The no hypothesis, we have to pick something in order to do our calculations. And we are going to pick the something, which is that these things are not related to each other. So our, our null hypothesis is that there is no, sorry, no. Between age category. And knowing Buzz Lightly. Okay, that's the no hypothesis. And you just have to say it in words. You can pitch it in terms of parameters if you want, but don't, because that's not what your lecturer says to do. But ultimately, you can ask, if there was no association between age category and knowing Buzz Lightyear, you would have expected the same percentage in every one of these groups to say they like, they know Buzz Lightyear. That's what you would have expected. Um, and so if it doesn't make any difference which age category you're in as to whether you know Buzz Lightyear, um, then you can really just lump it together in one great big group. Doesn't matter which age you are. And so you can figure out this sort of overall percentage of liking, of not liking, of knowing Buzz Lightyear. Um, and that's the percentage that should have been in every group if they're all the same. That's the reasoning behind it. And so I'm going to need to create totals for my table in order to do it. So this is what the computer will do if you ask it. So 20, 20 to 50, over 50, yes, no, total. So there were 13 and 5, 20 and 7, 5 and 10. Okay, so there were 18 under 20s, there were 27, 20 to 50s, and there were 15 over 50s, and there were 38 yeses and 22 noes. And the total total, just to be sure, um, is 38 plus 22, which is 60. And let's see, we've got 40 and 20. Yep, okay. So it adds up correctly in both directions. I haven't made any, well, I've made an even number of mistakes. <laughs> maybe maybe none, maybe, maybe more than one, but they've canceled each other out. So if it was true that age didn't make a difference to knowing Buzz Lightyear, this 38 out of 60, that fraction, that percentage, that's what I should have expected, that percentage here out of this 18, and that percentage here out of this 27, and that percentage here out of this 15. That's what I would have expected. And so I could figure out that percentage, 38 out of 60, that fraction of the 18, that's what should have been in this spot on average. And so I get 38 divided by 60 times 18, which is the same as 38 times 18 divided by 60. And so that's why the calculation for what you expected is row column, column total times row total divided by grand total. Um, but I don't remember that formula, but I do remember. Have to zoom out, uh, so just going to do some reasoning. This, this is what I'm thinking. 38 out of 60, that's the proportion of yeses in the entire group.
and the expected number of yes in the under 20 would be that times the 18. Because it would be that fraction of the 18 under 20, that's what it should end up in this spot. And that's the same answer, if you like, as 38 times 18 divided by 60. And so that's what ends up in this spot just here. And you can do that calculation everywhere. And so you do that calculation for all six spots, and then you add up all, and then you do observed minus expected squared divided by expected, and observed minus expected squared divided by expected, and observed minus expected squared divided by expected, and you do it for every box and you add them up. I choose not to do that, but that's what you do. You could have done it the other way around, but this way makes more sense for the story we're telling. But you could have said, well, the proportions that are that are under 20 is 18 out of 60, and that fraction of the 38 should have been in the yes group. Like should have been in the in the yes group. Um, no other way around. Yeah, yep, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Um, but it doesn't make as much sense from the story we're telling that that it shouldn't be that that knowing Buzz Lightyear causes your age. Um, but so this isn't about causation. It could be that knowing Buzz Lightyear allows you to guess someone's age. Because you can certainly think that, right? Because you know, there's all these quizzes you can take where, where, where it'll give, ask you various pop culture stuff and you can guess how old you are. You can predict things in that direction and that's what statistics is about. Um, so yeah, even though the causation is the other way and we know the causation is the other way, we can still predict it the wrong way. Yeah. Okay, and you do all of that and it produces a chi-squared statistic. So then we'll do observed minus expected divided by expect squared divided by expected because that's what Pearson tells us to do. And Pearson says that if you add them all up, this is the Greek letter sigma, which stands for sum, then what you'll get is a chi-squared statistic. And it will be distributed according to chi-squared distribution with a number of degrees of freedom. And the correct degrees of freedom in this case is the number of boxes you need to fill in to figure out what the other ones are if you want to keep the totals the same. So look at this. If I kept the totals the same and I filled in this box, then I would know what that one is. And if I filled in this box, I would know what that one is. But if I had these two boxes filled, I would know what that one is. And once I knew what that one is, I would know what this one is. And so I only need to know two of these boxes to be able to figure out the rest. It's two, I have freedom to choose two of them. And so what you do is that you cross out a column and a row, don't include the totals, and the number of boxes left, that's the degrees of freedom which is the same as one less than the number of categories in one variable times one less than the number of categories in the other one. But I find it easier because I'm drawing the table anyway to um, go back to the table, cross out one row and one column and the number of boxes left is the degrees of freedom because I can count more easily than calculate. So, yeah. And then let's just see if I can get R to do it for me. Um, but this is where you'd normally get the yeses and no, like, actually, just a second, I'm going to pause the video. Okay, I, I'm ready. I've, I've done all my things. This is what the data might look like. I might have a response, yes or no, and an age. And I've got some yeses who are young, some yeses who are middle, some yeses who are old, and so on. Um, and then I can do... Let me just close that. And then I should be able to do the chi-squared test. Um, on, whoa. Yep, 
Are you used to the dollar sign thing of picking out a column from some data? Yeah. Ta-da! So usually what you've got is an original list of data where you've got the category for each individual. Um, and it will automatically create the two-way table all by itself. Um, and it'll do this. But if you've already got the two-way table, you can actually ask it to do it directly from that. And I'll show you that as well. Um, so um, but it's done the chi-squared test for me. And so it's calculated. Chi square statistic has come out to 7.7671. The degrees of freedom is two, like I said, and the p value is 0 0.02058. Uh huh. Oh, cool. So at the 5% level, significant. Um, well, no, just a second. Yeah, strong evidence. Strong evidence under at the 5% level. Um, and I would declare, therefore, that there does seem to be an association between age category and knowing Buzz Lightyear. And then I would need to try and investigate which one seems to be the one that causes the difference. And according to my original table, it looks like my over 50s are less likely to know Buzz Lightyear on average. Um, yeah, and you would calculate the residual for each of them. So I will, um, one thing I will say is I could have done this chi-squared test like this. If you, didn't, if you didn't have the original list of data and all you had was the table, you would have to create a two-way table from the, from, you'd have to list the two-way table somehow in your data. And so, oh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, just a second. All right. So my matrix had 13. 13 and 5 and 20 and 7 and 5 and 10. And it had uh, three rows and two columns. I'm really hoping this works. I have no idea what it just did. Sorry. I... It's not the same results as the other one, though, is it? All right. I, I don't know how to do it the other way, so it doesn't matter. Um, you would, your um, assignment question had, um, whoops, sorry. Your original assignment question, I think, had the data the way I set it up with a big list of who's in what category. Um, and you can just ask it to do that. And so I declare there is strong evidence that age and knowing Buzz Lightly are associated. And in fact, it does look like the older people are less likely. But only the over 50s, the people from 20 to 50 doesn't like, I don't know, it looks like our 20 to 50s are more likely probably to know Buzz Lightyear than our under 20s. That's, that seems right. I did, it's just made up data. <laughs> um, cool. So all statistical tests work that way. There will always be some sort of decision about about what calculation to do that some statistician has discovered is, is a good one. And there will be a distribution of all of the things that that number could have been um, under the, you, you need to choose a null hypothesis that allows you to know what the distribution is of all the things it could have been, and then it would have a distribution. And sometimes it's chi-squared distribution, and sometimes it's an F distribution, and sometimes it's a T distribution, sometimes it's a Z distribution. 
there's just lots of different distributions for different situations. Um, and this time it's a chi-squared because Pearson thought that was the best choice. And it is technically an approximation and it only works if you've got at least five in every expected box. Um, it's not that bad otherwise. Um, and there are other things to do in other situations. Um, I will say one last thing, that this situation where there's exactly two categories and you are trying to predict which category you're in based on something else with exactly two categories. And so you have like, for example, treatment A and, you know, treatment and placebo, for example. And then you have like survive, yes or no, for example. Um, probably not with people, don't normally play with people's lives like that, but it is a thing that people do. Um, then you can do a chi-square test on this and it would be a chi-square test for association and we would have one degree of freedom because when you do the, the table, there'll be treatment and placebo, yes and no, and you'll cross out one row and one column and there'll be one box left. And so you'll get a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. Um, but you've done situations like this in other things because you could ask the question, instead of asking, are they related? You could ask, is the survival percentage, like, I guess they call it a survival rate, don't they? The same in both treatments. You could ask that question. And it's the same question, really. Like if the survival set rate is the same in both treatments, then they're not related. But this question, you've already been given a test that does that. And it was the Z test for two proportions. They give the same p-value. The Z test for two proportions will give the exact same The Z test for two proportions will give you the exact same p-value as the chi-squared test does. In fact, the value of chi-squared that you calculate in this one and the value of Z that you calculate in this one, the chi-squared will be the square of the Z in this one. Um, yeah, so maybe you'll get, you because know, you get a Z test, right? And you'll, with the P hat and the P1 hat and the P2 hat and all of this stuff, that, that Z, maybe it'll come out to, you know, 4.1, well then the class squared test will come out to 16 point something. Like they will, they they are related in exactly that way. Um, they are the exact same test. And if you did this, you know, flip a coin, for example. And so you've got heads or tails as options, and you could ask yourself, is the proportion 50-50, which would be a chi-square test for goodness of fit, or you could ask, is the proportion of heads equal to 50%, which is just about one of them. And that would be a Z test for one proportion. And again, they give you the same p-value. So I just wanted to point that out. A natural question to ask at this time would be, why would you do one or the other? If all you want is a p-value, you can use whichever one you want. 
whichever one feels natural at the time, they'll give you the same results. But what the chi-square test for goodness of fit doesn't give you is a natural way to produce a confidence interval. Really confidence intervals, right? Yeah. So in this one, we can make a confidence interval for the proportion of heads from the way that we can uh, we rearrange the way that we do the hypothesis test to produce a confidence interval. We can't do that from the chi-square test for goodness of fit. It's a bit more complicated the way we did that calculation. It's a little harder to see what the hell is going on. Um, and so this one can give you a confidence interval. We can go, oh yes, the proportion isn't 50%. What is the proportion? And then you could answer that with a confidence interval. Um, whereas this one, is the proportion 50-50? Well, what is it? Sorry, can't tell you. That's the difference between them. Yeah. And what the goodness of fit test can do is if there's more than two options, you can test them all simultaneously. All right. I really will stop now. Unless, but you know, I've got a few minutes. Does someone want to ask a question? Yes, you could if you wanted, but traditionally, traditionally, when you do this, you're only thinking about one of the proportions at a time. You you do a whole separate test for the other one, and it should give you the same results, but you'll get a different. No, but you would just ask you would but you can do a calculation of the confidence interval separately without doing the test, right? You know, you know, Z hat. Z equals uh, P equals like P hat plus or minus crap. <laughs> um, Z star times stuff. You can do that for both proportions if you want. Um, but mostly they're in situations where you don't really care about what the other one is. You only care about one of them. And look, if the proportion of heads is fifty is forty percent, then the proportion of tails is sixty percent. That's the way it is. Um, so yeah, I think people do do ones where there's a confidence interval for every proportion separately. Um, yeah, you have to go and do them all separately. So I think in this course where they're trying to keep it simple, they don't, they just didn't get into that. Um, but they're great questions to ask. These are the sorts of questions that ask you how things are, you know, you find out how they're related and what you do instead. These are sorts of things that when you do real research, you have to talk through with someone, um, basically, which is why people train as statisticians so they can be the someone that you talk to. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for being here and asking good questions. And um, I wish you the very, very best with whatever exams you have, um, especially this one. And um, I'm just going to stop the recording.